The second leader we will honor today is our keynote speaker, the 55th governor of the state of Louisiana, Bobby Jindal. The Wall Street Journal has called him Louisiana's prodigy governor, who is critical to reinvigorating the Republican Party. The Washington Post has deemed him a phenom who has penetrated Washington, D.C.'s ego and hierarchy to land in a spectacularly influential spot. Rush Limbaugh has referred to him as the next Ronald Reagan. He was born in the state he now leads on June 10, 1971. He graduated from Baton Rouge High School and then attended Brown University where he managed to graduate with honors in both biology and public policy. More impressively, he left Brown University as a conservative, which is, which is practically a miracle. But following, following Brown, Jindal turned down invitations to study law and medicine at both Harvard and Yale. Instead, he attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. Governor Jindal entered public service in 1996 when he was appointed secretary of the Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals. The DHH is Louisiana's largest department with more than 12,000 employees, hundreds of facilities, and a $4 billion budget. During his time at DHH, he was responsible for turning a $400 million budget deficit into a surplus of $220 million. This great achievement proved to be just one of many examples of Jindal's remarkable capabilities as an executive with a stalwart commitment to fiscal responsibility. Jindal went on to serve in a number of other notable positions in both state and federal government, including serving as the executive director of the National Bipartisan Commission on the Future of Medicare, serving as president of the University of Louisiana system, one of the 20 largest higher education systems in the country, overseeing more than 80,000 students per year, and as the assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services during the Bush administration. In 2004, Jindal was elected for his first of two terms as congressman for Louisiana's first congressional district. 2008, he was sworn in as Louisiana's 55th governor, and he was reelected in 2012. One position Jindal has not yet held is the president's presidency of the United States, but rumor has it that could soon change. Jindal's work in Louisiana has arrested the attention of leaders across America. He has become known for his innovative solutions to the most taxing problems of our time. He's embarked on some of the most comprehensive reforms to health care and education in America, and he has also ruthlessly eliminated burdensome taxes that once deterred investment in his state. As a result of his pro-business policies, more than $54 billion in capital investment has poured into Louisiana, creating tens of thousands of jobs and propelling his state to its highest rankings ever for business friendliness. Jindal is the type of leader who makes decisions on principle and yet finds creative solutions that others haven't even imagined before. He's setting an example of the type of governance and the type of conservatism that must be embarked upon if America's future shall, be, shall prove to be as bright as her past. I would like to ask Governor Jindal and the provost to join me at the podium. In recognition of Governor Bobby Jindal's unflinching, unflinching commitment to the preservation of liberty in America and in acknowledgement of his innovative and principled leadership in these consequential times, by the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Liberty University, the Doctor of Humanities degree is hereby conferred upon Bobby Jindal with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. Now to deliver our 41st annual commencement address, join with me in welcoming Governor Bobby Jindal. President Falwell, thank you for that very generous introduction. Congratulations to the graduates of the class of 2014. Let's give them another round of applause for this wonderful accomplishment. Now, I've got to warn you in advance. I've done a number of these graduations. I want to tell the students, you're going to have to bear with your parents today. You might witness them shedding a tear or two. When you see that, you might think they're replaying the years in their minds. You might think they're remembering when you first learned how to ride a bike, when you took your first steps. You think they'll be sadly wondering where all those years have gone by. But you'd be wrong about that. 
Those tears you see are actually tears of joy. Joy derived from knowing the tuition bills from Liberty University will finally stop coming. In fact, because of this, I bet your parents, the truth is your parents are the most genuinely happy people here today. And by the way, this is probably a good time to let you know that I hate giving commencement addresses. I really do. The graduates and their families, they simply want to get on with it. The only worst thing that I have to sit in, the only thing that's worse than having to sit through a commencement address is having to sit through a commencement address by a politician. <laughs> and all I can say about that, to use the college vernacular, it sucks to be you right now. <laughs> now I thought about giving you a speech today, lecturing you about going out into the world and working hard and all that stuff. But I got bored with that. I thought about giving you a speech talking about all the great things that are happening in Louisiana, but I knew you'd be bored with that. I thought about giving a speech telling you that if you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. But I decided I didn't want to lie to you today. I thought about telling you and giving you a speech telling you that debt is good. Redistribution of wealth is smart and personal morality doesn't matter anymore. But you only need to know those things if you're planning to go to work for the federal government in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Instead, let me start today by telling you just a few things about my personal story. My parents immigrated to this great country nearly half a century ago. They came without much, but they had heard about the idea of America. And that's what America really is. It's an idea and the central tenet of that idea is freedom. When my folks arrived in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1971, my mother was already pregnant with me. I was what you would politely call a pre-existing condition. <laughs> my dad didn't look around for handouts or for the government to pay the hospital bill. No, instead he worked out paying for me on an installment plan. Indeed, shortly after I was born, he asked the hospital if they would take me back if he skipped a payment. <laughs> he was hopeful, but they said no, he was stuck with me. You know, my dad grew up dirt poor. He was the only one in a large family of nine to get past the fifth grade. But he knew the idea of America was that if you work hard, if you apply yourself, you'll be successful. When he got to Baton Rouge, he decided to get a job. He simply went through the yellow pages calling company after company. He finally wore a guy down on the phone from the railroad company, which is pretty amazing when you consider the fact that my dad's got an accent. Not like me, not a southern accent, but an accent. He not only convinced this guy to hire him, but he also then told the guy who said you could start on Monday, well, that's great. He said, I don't have a car, I don't have a driver's license. So he tells his new boss, you're gonna have to pick me up on the way to work Monday morning. Yeah, I could tell you a lot of other amusing stories about my folks adjusting a life in America. But I want to fast forward to the most significant thing that has ever happened to me. And it happened when I was a child. A friend I knew gave me a rather odd Christmas present that year. He gave me my very first copy of the Bible. Sometime later, a girl I knew invited me to church. Here I was looking for a date. Meanwhile, she was looking to save my soul. I found the gospel message intriguing, but I'll be honest, I was skeptical. I'm an analytical sort of person. I decided to have to investigate all these fanciful claims. I started reading this Bible, oftentimes hiding in my closet, not sure how my parents would respond. The short story is this. I read the words of Jesus Christ and I realized they were true. I used to say that I had found God, but I think it's more accurate to say that he found me. And it happened because there were people brave enough to plant the seeds of the gospel in my life. Many years later, I became a candidate for political office. In one of my first debates, I got this question. They asked, what was the single most important moment in your life? Now, I had just endured countless hours of debate prep sessions with my political consultants and staff. That's basically where you get to sit around and be savagely grilled by the people you pay, your political consultants and staffers. I knew exactly what they hoped I would say. 
They'd argue I should try to appeal to female voters by offering a touching story about when I asked Supriya, my wife, for her hand in marriage, or about the birth of our first child, a beautiful baby girl. And yes, those were great moments. But instead, I decided to do something new in politics. I told the audience the truth that day, that the most significant moment in my life was the moment that I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. My political consultants began shifting uncomfortably in their seats. I've got to admit, I enjoyed that moment. I thought of Matthew 10, which says, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Or of Romans 1, which says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Now it is said that College is an intellectual pursuit involving reason and logic. I went to Brown University in the Ivy League, as you've heard. It is a place that prides itself in intellectual reasoning. One of the good things about going to Brown is that I was quickly able to become president of the college Republicans on campus. The only other Republican student at Brown became the vice president. You know, some kids go off to college, they lose their way. They become convinced that their faith is not an intellectual pursuit. Nothing could be further from the truth. Reason and logic lead to truth, which means that reason and logic lead to God. There's a general view among many of the elites in America that truly enlightened folks realize that all this faith and religion stuff is just quaint and antiquated thinking from an earlier era, or that it is a nice restful place for those who are not as bright or as intellectually curious as they are. Again, nothing could be further from the truth. True intellectual curiosity will inevitably lead to an understanding of our Creator. You know, I noticed examples of this elitist view when, of faith when national political reporters, usually from places like Boston or New York or Washington, D.C., would come to Baton Rouge to interview me in my first years as governor. Inevitably, during those interviews, they'd say something like this. Governor, you're a smart guy. We know you went to Brown, you're a Rhodes Scholar, so tell me, how is it that you call yourself pro-life? How is it you say you oppose gay marriage? How is it you say you oppose gun control? Be honest, you're just saying that stuff to get elected in the Deep South, right? So of course, I'd like to have a little fun with these reporters. I'd lean over the desk and in whispered tones, pretending to confide in them, I'd say, well, just between us. Do me a favor. Go tell your editors the bad news. Tell them I absolutely believe everything I say. As you can imagine, those interviews ended rather abruptly. They never came back after that for some reason. Let me shift gears for a moment now and talk straight with you about the world we live in, the culture into which our students are about to wade. Today's world is increasingly hostile to matters of faith. American culture has in many ways become a secular culture. At a minimum to our graduates, it's safe to say you're going into a world that is far more secular than the one your parents entered. A few months ago, I had the opportunity to speak at the Reagan Library out in California, where I talked about the silent war on religious liberty in America today. The Declaration of Independence says that we are a nation constituted in accordance with the laws of nature and of nature's God, and that we're a people endowed with our, by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. Let me make this explicit. The source and justification for the very existence of the United States of America is and always has been contingent upon the understanding of man as a created being, with the Creator conferring his intrinsic rights amongst them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, how we understand and approach that Creator is properly left to the hearts and consciences of every citizen. For me, I'm a Catholic Christian. My parents, they're Hindus. I'm blessed to know Baptists, Jews, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, and so many more in the rich tapestry of American faiths. I also know men and women who acknowledge no denomination or creed, who confess to uncertainty about the divine. Yet look to the richness of nature and the majesty of this world and wonder and inwardly seek the author of it all. 
You know, these days we think this diversity of belief is tolerated under our law and constitution, but that's wrong. This diversity of belief is the foundation of our law and constitution. America does not sustain and create faith. Faith created and sustains America. America did not invent religious freedom. Religious freedom invented America. President, President John Adams in 1798 wrote to Massachusetts militiamen to remind them that our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. In 1798, this was simple common sense. In 2014, we're forced to confront a question that would have been unthinkable to President Adams and President Washington and President Reagan and every other American throughout history who believed in America's founding premise. What happens when our government decides it no longer needs a moral and religious people? Today, the American people, whether we know it or not, are mired in a silent war. It threatens the fabric of our communities, the health of our public square, and the endurance of our constitutional governance. It is a war against the propositions in the Declaration of Independence. It is a war against the spirit that motivated abolitionism. It is a war against the faith that motivated the civil rights struggle. It is a war against the soul of countless acts of charity. It is a war against the conscience that drives social change. It is a war against the heart that binds our neighborhoods together. It is a war against America's best self at America's best moments. It is a war, a silent war against religious liberty. This war is waged in our courts, and the halls of political power. It is pursued with grim and relentless determination by a group of like-minded elites determined to transform our country from a land sustained by faith into a land where faith is silenced, privatized, and circumscribed. Their vision of America is not the vision of the founding. It is not even the vision of 10 years ago. It's a vision in which an individual's devotion to Almighty God is accorded about as much respect as a casual hobby and with about as many rights and protections. These elites to this point have faced little opposition, but there is a remnant who have the temerity to believe in America and her promises and to do something about it. My question to our graduates is, will you be a part of that remnant? Margaret Thatcher famously said this, Europe was created by history. America was created by philosophy. The secular elites understand this just as well as she did. They know that to take over America, they must make war on this philosophy. This silent war is the real undercurrent driving politically fractious debates in a number of areas of policy. But why is this war happening? What does it mean for the country and people of faith? Why does it represent such a fundamental challenge to our American identity and the exceptional history that makes our nation great? Consider three storylines playing out in our states and the highest courts over the past several years in three different areas, yet all with overlapping effects. First, the freedom to exercise your religion and the way you run your business, large or small, is under assault. You've likely heard of the Obama administration's case against Hobby Lobby, a mega craft store and a family business whose battle against President Obama's contraception mandate will end up as a Supreme Court decision. The national chain filed suit after being told they'd be fined $1.3 million per day if they didn't pay for abortifacients through their insurance. Hobby Lobby is nothing less than an all-American success story. This family-owned company was launched in Oklahoma in 1970 with nothing more than a $600 loan and a workshop in a garage. Today, they have 588 stores in 47 states. They have more than 13,000 full-time employees. They expanded branching out to create a Christian supply shop to sell Bibles and craft supplies, opening another 35 stores in seven states with almost 400 more employees. This is entrepreneurship at its best, a family-owned business that went from $600 in a garage to two companies that employ almost 14,000 people full-time across the country. Through it all, Hobby Lobby has retained the guiding principles of their devout founders. Their statement of purpose begins with a Bible verse, and they are closed every Sunday. They're committed to honor the Lord by being generous employers, 
paying well above minimum wage, increasing salaries four years in a row, even in the midst of the enduring recession. None of this matters to the Obama administration. The argument they've advanced successfully thus far is that faithful business owners cannot operate under the assumption that they can use their moral principles to guide the way their places of business spend money. According to the administration's legal arguments, the family that owns Hobby Lobby is not protected by the First Amendment's free exercise of religion clause. That's the part of the First Amendment which states that Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. The Obama administration and Attorney General Eric Holder argue that Hobby Lobby is a for-profit secular employer, and a secular entity by definition does not exercise religion. A federal judge agreed. Since Hobby Lobby is, quote, a secular corporation, they have no right to be guided by the religious beliefs of their ownership. Now keep in mind, Hobby Lobby wasn't arguing that so-called morning after pills should be illegal or banned or doing anything to prevent their employees from paying the small cost of such pills. They just had a serious moral problem of paying for something they viewed as inherently against their deeply held beliefs. The Obama administration's argument ignores these beliefs and treats them as little more than an inconvenience to their ever-expanding regulatory state. Now let's be clear, this is bigger than Hobby Lobby. The administration's argument strikes at the core of our understanding of free exercise of religion. This case could have enormous ramifications for religious business owners across our country. Under the Obama regime, you've got the protection of the First Amendment as an individual, you see, but the instant you start a business, you lose those protections. And that brings us to the second front in the silent war. The assault on our freedom of association as people of faith to form organizations where we work alongside others who share our views. This brings us to the Hosanna Tabor case, which revolved around the ability of a Lutheran academy in Michigan to fire a teacher. Here, the Obama administration advanced another extreme argument, claiming that job regulations prevented the academy from being able to fire anybody over a difference in beliefs. The lawyers for the Obama administration went far beyond the issues of the case to instead advance the legally absurd position that there is no general ministerial exception, exemption, arguing that religious groups don't even have the constitutionally protected right to select their own ministers or rabbis. Thankfully here, the administration's extreme position was rebutted by the Supreme Court in decisive fashion with a 9-0 decision opposing its perspective. So for the time being, at least, the government doesn't get to decide who can preach the gospel. But the important thing to note is that the government wanted to make that decision. I don't know about you, to me that is truly offensive and frightening. The administration advanced that extreme argument because it is consistent with the view of many on the left, particularly elite liberal legal scholars, that the God that we must worship first is government, that our rights are doled out by Washington as they see fit. But these cases are only the beginning. There is a bigger threat, the assault on your freedom of expression in all areas of life. Illinois shows us a preview of what this looks like. In legislation, they propose altering the definition of marriage. They would have required churches and other congregations to essentially close their doors to outsiders, stop providing services to the community, and close off their facilities to other nonprofits, church groups, in order to avoid being required to host same-sex ceremonies. They wouldn't allow religious bodies to rent their facilities to non-members for use in weddings, for example. They would drive churches to have to eliminate classes, day schools, counseling, fellowship, fellowship hall meetings, soup kitchens, and much, much more. In other words, this law and others like it we require believers to essentially choose to break with their deeply held theological beliefs or to give up their daily activity of evangelism, retreat from public life, and sacrifice their property rights. This is the next, next stage of the assault, and it is only beginning. Today, an overwhelming majority of those who belong to a religious denomination in America, that's more than half the country, are members of organizations that affirm the traditional definition of marriage. 
All of those de denominations will be targeted in large and small degrees in the coming years. For example, will churches in America even be able to remain part of the public square in a time when their views on sin are in direct conflict with the culture? And when expressing those views will be seen as hiding, quote, hateful speech behind religious protections. This war on religious liberty, or your freedom to exercise your religion, on your freedom to associate, on your freedom of expression, is only going to continue. It's going to continue because of an idea, a wrong-headed concept. The concept that religious freedom means you have the freedom to worship, and that is all. It is this uh, misbegotten and un-American conception of religious liberty that your rights only begin and end in the pew. This is absolutely ridiculous. We as Christians and we as Americans have the right to practice our faith and to protect our conscience no matter where we happen to be. But it's also important that we must keep perspective on this silent war. It is certainly a challenging time to be a believer in America. But we must also consider the plight of believers around the world today. And nation after nation, Christians are being slaughtered by radical Islamists for their beliefs. It is a time of enormous upheaval in the Middle East where your beliefs can lead to your church being burned, your children being kidnapped, or they can put you on the wrong side of a gun. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this, the cross is laid on every Christian. It begins with the call to abandon the attachments of the world. When Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. Today around the world, many Christians are living out that calling. That is a shooting war over religion, not a silent one. So here in America, we should be grateful that the laws and principles put in place by the founders, men like George Mason and James Madison and Patrick Henry, who understood the importance of religious liberty have endured for so long. They are the reason America has come so far. It is those same principles that should guide us farther still. Principles that understand the power is derived from the people, not from government. Calvin Coolidge understood this in his own time. He said, we live in an age of science and of abounding accumulation of material things. These did not create our declaration. Our declaration created them. The things of the Spirit come first. Unless we cling to that, all of our material prosperity, overwhelming though it may appear, will turn to a barren scepter in our grasp. The president was right. The things of this spirit do come first. We must act and act now to protect them. The temptation in some corners is to ask for a truce in these fractious battles. But in practical terms, a truce would only amount to those who value religious liberty laying down our arms. Our religious freedom was won over the course of centuries of persecution and blood, and we should not surrender them without a fight. Make no mistake, the war over religious liberty is the war over free speech. Without the first, there's no such thing as the second. Though this is not a battle any of us would have chosen, it is one we are called to join, and we should do so gladly, with our hearts and minds set on things above. Our religious liberty must in no way ever be linked to the ever-changing opinions of the public. To the contrary, we must understand that our freedom of conscience protects all Americans of every persuasion, however those persuasions may evolve. Secondly, it is unmistakable that most of the Obama administration's attacks on religious liberty are aimed at conservative Christians. But the fact is, is that our religious liberties are designed to protect people of all faiths. And I'll note that while I'm best described as an evangelical Catholic, my extended family is quite diverse when it comes to matters of faith. And our liberties in America demand equal protections for all. Third, for those of you that follow pop culture, you may have taken note of the recent flap between the Robertson family of Duck Dynasty fame and the A&E network that produces and broadcasts the Duck Dynasty show. You may have noticed that one of the first and the loudest and most aggressive defenders of the Robertson family was the governor of Louisiana. Now, you may think I was defending the Robertsons simply because I'm the governor of their home state, the great state of Louisiana. 
You may have thought that I defended them simply because my boys are huge fans of the show. You would have been wrong about that. I defended them because they have every right to speak their minds. However, indelicately, they may choose to do so. Now, of course, A&E is a for-profit business. They can choose what they want to put on the air. But there was something much, much larger at stake here. There was a time when liberals in this country believed in debate. But that is increasingly not the case for the modern left in America. No, the modern left has grown tired of debate. Their new strategy is simply to try to silence their critics. These leftists immediately mobilized. They did all they could not to debate the issues, but rather to attempt to silence the Robertsons. And as you well know, the same thing happened again just this week with another demonstration of intolerance from the entertainment industry. HGTV was working on a new show featuring the Benham brothers, twin brothers who graduated from right here in Liberty University in 1998. I know they've been recognized, but I'd like them to ask them to stand and let's give them another round of applause for their courage and grace. HGTV canceled the show this week, allegedly because they learned that one of the brothers had protested at the Democratic Party convention and the other had protested at an abortion clinic. I want you to think about that for a minute. If these guys had protested at the Republican Party convention or here at Liberty University, instead of canceling their show, HGTV would have probably given them a raise and a new deal. There was a time when the left preached tolerance. And the truth is they are still indeed tolerant unless they happen to disagree with you. To paraphrase William F. Buckley, a liberal is somebody who welcomes dissent and then is astonished to find that there is any. You know, the modern left in America is completely intolerant of the views of people of faith. They want a completely secular society where people of faith keep their views to themselves. Remember this quote from our 40th president, President Ronald Reagan. Freedom is a fragile thing and is never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by inheritance. It must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation. Now to be clear again, churches in America are not being burned to the ground. Christians are not being slaughtered for their faith. There's really no comparison to the persecution of people of faith inside our borders and outside. So we've established that our culture has taken a secular turn. We've established that persecution of Christians is on the rise throughout the world. We've established that religious liberty here in America is under siege. We've established that the left is no longer wants to debate, they simply want to silence us. So now what? What do we do about it and what should you do about it? First of all, you should be optimistic and be of good cheer. This is an exciting time to be a believer. It is true that Christians are the last group that it is okay to discriminate against in America. But so what? If God is with us, who could be against us? Amen. To the graduates, just a couple of last words of advice. Don't see yourself as a victim. America already has enough people who see themselves as victims. Go out into this world. Boldly be salt and light in a world that needs you now more than ever before. Most of all, you should be bold in your faith. Embrace opportunities to stand up for the truth. Just like those people in my life. You never know when you might be planting a seed of the gospel that could change somebody's life for all eternity, change their life forever. God bless you, congratulations on your graduation. God bless the great faculty, staff, and students at Liberty University. Congratulations to the class of 2014.